It is good to be with you guys today. Um, again, happy Mother's Day. We're glad you're here. Um, it, I uh, coached three baseball games this weekend, and my, my son uh, was in a, he plays high school baseball for Veritas Academy, and they were in the regional playoffs, and, and it hit me about <clears throat> halfway through his regional playoff game as I was screaming my head off uh, that I had to preach Sunday. I had completely forgotten, and so I'm about this close from losing my voice, so if my voice cracks or <clears throat> I cough a little bit, please forgive me. But um, if you brought a Bible today, open up to the book of Jonah. We are going through our series, the book of Jonah. <clears throat> There's a little Old Testament book that is uh, pretty amazing. Most of you uh, probably grew up hearing the story of Jonah and the whale, but there's so much more to it than that. And so uh, I invite you to open up your Bibles to Jonah chapter three, verse 10. Jonah chapter three, verse 10. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. We're gonna have the scriptures behind me on the screen. You can follow along. But um, <clears throat> we come to a place in the story today <clears throat> where even when I was growing up, and um, even into my young adulthood, I didn't really fully understand it. And um, I remember reading this when I was younger and younger in the ministry, and I didn't quite get it. And that's Jonah's response when the people of Nineveh repent of their sin and turn to God. And God shows them mercy that they turn from their sin. <clears throat> We're going to try to understand his response today. I'll tell you what his response is. We'll try to get our minds around it. <clears throat> Sorry, because until recently, I never really quite understood why he reacts the way that he did. Now, the first part of the story of Jonah, I completely get. And over the last few weeks, we've talked about it. We, we've seen the story that, you know, God is loving and God is compassionate. And because of his love and, and compassion, he chooses to call this evil city of Nineveh to repentance. It, it, it shows that God wasn't just into the Israelites, he didn't just love the Israelites, but he loved all the nations, and so he is calling uh, these people to repentance, and so we see his love and we see his mercy that he does not destroy him. Now, here's the thing. When God calls Jonah to go and preach that story of repentance, Jonah doesn't want to do it. And the reason he doesn't want to do it is because he doesn't like the Ninevites. He thinks they're evil, he thinks they're a vile people, and the last thing in the world he wants to do is go and preach to these evil and vile people. And so he basically says to God, God, I'm out. I'm not gonna do it. <clears throat> so he doesn't go to Nineveh. He takes off on a boat to Tarshish, and then God has to send a storm to turn him around and, and get him back. He jumps in the water. Um, whale comes, takes him, brings him to Nineveh, and reluctantly he preaches this message of repentance to the people of Nineveh. Now, um, Jonah's reaction to this, up to this point. And Jonah's response to God's calling on his life up to this point makes all the sense in the world to me. Like I can totally relate to running from a call that God has on my life. I've done it before. I, I get the concept clearly of, of God leading me to do something and I just don't wanna do it. I get it. Um, I can envision a scenario. I can envision a scenario <clears throat> that if God were to call me to go and preach to a group of people that I did not like, me dragging my feet and saying, God, I don't want to go do this. I don't want to preach for you to these people. I get all that. In the, it makes total sense to me. But this next part, uh, Jonah's response, I've never quite really understood. And so I want you to watch Jonah's response when he hears that these people that he's just preached to, these evil Ninevites, when they actually repented, they turned from their sin, they turned back to God, and God's not gonna punish them. Check it out. So Jonah chapter three, verse 10. <clears throat> it says, when God saw their deeds, that's the Ninevites, and they've turned from their sin, they've repented. When God saw their deeds, they turned from their wicked ways. Then God relented concerning their calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. And so God looked down at the Ninevites, Jonah preaches, they turn from their sin, and God says he relents from the calamity he was gonna put upon them, and he doesn't punish them. He gives them his mercy and his grace. Now I want you to watch Jonah's response. This should be a happy day, but watch Jonah's response in Jonah chapter four, verse one. <clears throat> but it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry but it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. 
<clears throat> when I was young, that blew my mind. When I was young in the ministry, that blew my mind. When I read that verse, I remember thinking, Jonah, what in the world are you talking about? Why are you so upset? You just preached one message, and an entire city came to Christ. What are you mad about? Came to the Lord. What are you mad about? That is like every preacher's fantasy. How cool would it be? How amazing would it be if all I had to do is just walk up here one day <clears throat> and just preach one sermon? And for, for some reason, because of that one sermon, the entire city of Austin got saved in one sermon. I would drop the mic and retire right then. I would be done. I would move to the Keys and buy a boat. I, 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 and so I'm reading this and thinking, what in the world is wrong with you? Why are you upset? All right? <clears throat> but in the next verse, you give, he gives us a little bit of insight into what's going on in his heart. Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. And he prayed to the Lord. So it says he was mad. They repented. He got angry. And he starts to pray. And watch what he says to God. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is not this what I said when yet I was still in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. And so Nineveh repents. God shows his mercy and his grace to him. He doesn't punish him. And Jonah looks at God. He gets angry and says, God, I knew you were gonna do that. I knew you were gonna do that, God. He says, this is why I went to Tarshish in the first place, because if I knew that I preached to them, these horrible, vile Ninevites, I knew you were gonna be gracious to them and not take them out. So I didn't want to go in the first place. <clears throat> and that was the part I never understood growing up. Why in the world would you get mad that God was not going to destroy somebody? That's the question. <clears throat> and here's the answer. All right? Very straightforward, very simple. I'm going to tell you why he's mad. Here it is. Jonah's disdain and Jonah's disgust and his utter dislike you might even say hatred of these people, the, the Ninevites, was so significant, was so real, was so palpable, that he would rather, in his heart, he would rather see God destroy him than for them to come to repentance and see the mercy and the grace of God. <clears throat> Last time here, again, never really understood that growing up, but I completely understand it now. I totally get that now, where he's coming from. Because the older I get and the longer I, I've, I've lived, not only, church, have I seen that sinful response in my heart, but I've seen that sinful reaction and that sinful response growing increasingly common in our culture and even in the church. All right, now here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I'm seeing in the church of Jesus Christ today, and that's that you have people you have a ton of people that genuinely love God. I mean, they're the real deal. They actually love the Lord. And they actually love people. They legitimately love people. So they, there's all these people in the church. They love God. They love people except when it comes to those people. Except when it comes to those people. When it, when it comes to that person. I love God. I love people except that person or that group of people that I fear or that I don't like or that have hurt me or have wronged me. And so let me just kind of say today and ask you the question, do you have those people in your life? Do you have that person in your life? <clears throat> Most of us do. Most of us do, and our attitude towards that group of people, our attitude towards that person becomes more like Jonah than we'd ever care to admit. And one of the first times that I was aware, at least, it's probably in my heart before, but one of the first times I was really aware that I'm as capable of, of having this attitude of Jonah towards a group of people that I, at the end of the day, didn't really want to see him to repentance, I wanted to see him punished, was on September 11th. 2001, now, I'm gonna just be kind of vulnerable with you guys today and <clears throat> tell you a little bit about my heart, which is pretty ugly. 
But let me give you some background before I do. I, um, I grew up in East Texas. And so if you don't know anything about East Texas, East Texas is kind of a slightly less refined version of West Texas with just a few more pine trees, all right? And so that's, that's when I grew up. I didn't really walk with God growing up. I went from <clears throat> East Texas to Texas A&M University uh, where I joined the, yeah, where I joined the, te- uh, the Corps Cadets and got brainwashed. And, um, <laughs> and so on, keep, keep in mind that on September 11th, I'm just kind of a really barely saved East Texas redneck with a military background. Good combination, all right? <clears throat> and I remember... I remember vividly exactly what I was doing when the second plane hit the building. I, was, I saw it happen. I was sitting there um, at the kitchen table, and we were eating breakfast. My son, who was a year, JD, who was a year and a half at the time, he was in a high chair, stuffing eggs in his mouth, and um, and we were, Jennifer and I were watching. You know, because the first building was kind of smoking, and we're like, "What in the world's going on?" And then we're watching as the plane hits. And I remember, I stood up from my chair, and I, this is what came out of my mouth. I said, that's Osama bin Laden. And it just kind of hit me. I was like, that has to be a terrorist attack. The only dude I knew that had ever done anything like that was Osama bin Laden. I said, that's Osama bin Laden. And I want you to know something, I was mad. My response was not fear. It was not initially sadness. My response was absolute anger. I was livid. I was so mad, I was shaking. I was so angry, I was shaking. And kind of the core cadet thing kicked in, and the, literally one of my first thoughts was, all right, it's about to be on, and I'm quitting the ministry, and I'm joining the Army Rangers. That was like the first thing that was going through my mind. <clears throat> and so that night, you know, the events unfolded, and that evening, I was a youth pastor at the time, and, and our church was having a big prayer service, and, and man, like an hour before the thing started, people were lining up to get in there and pray excuse me, and so all the senior, or all the pastors rather, got in a room together, and we were kind of deciding what we were gonna pray. And the lead pastor kind of looked at all of us that were lined up there, and he said, all right, Bob, I want you to pray for the victims' families, and Jim, I want you to pray for our nation's leaders. And he looked at me, and he said, Matt, I want you to pray for our enemies. And I guess he saw the look on my face, because I was, I was, I was still pretty upset. I guess I was wearing it. True story. He goes, Matt, pray for our enemies. Then he goes, never mind, Matt. You don't pray for our enemies. Bob, you pray for our enemies. Matt, you pray for the victims' families. All right? <clears throat> and here's why. And again, it's funny, but that's sin. Because I had so much disdain in my heart for the people that attacked us that I, in that moment, I couldn't even pray for them. I couldn't bring myself to even pray for them. The last thing in the world in that moment, as a guy in his 20s, it was dumb. The last thing in my, in my mind that, that I wanted to see happen was the love and the mercy and the grace of God to be poured out on our enemies. Now looking back, <clears throat> I realized that that is the exact same heart that Jonah has. That's what's going on in Jonah's life. You know, I, I had so much disdain and anger for these people that attacked us that if in that moment God would have spoken to me and said, hey, I need you to go preach the gospel to these people that attacked us, I would have run so fast to Tarshish it and make your head spin. And so listen, my whole life, I've read this part of the story and I'm kind of shaking my head and thought, man, Jonah, what is wrong with you? you you're an idiot. Why in the world would you not want God to give his grace and mercy to people until I realized that this attitude is more prevalent in us than I have ever realized. And it's not the heart of God. And at the end of the day, it's sinful. Now I want you guys to listen to me really carefully. And when I say listen to me really carefully, please listen to me really, really carefully in what I'm about to say. It'll save you an email, save you getting mad. Um, I'm not saying that we don't fight injustice. I'm not saying that. I'm a big proponent of justice. I have spent my ministerial career in many ways fighting for justice. That's not what this text means. I'm not saying we don't fight against the evils in society. The pursuit 
of appropriate justice when people are wronged or oppressed or hurt or victimized is absolutely stone cold biblical. So I want you to hear that clearly. But here's what I, here's what I am saying and here's what I think the text is saying is that the reason this story is in the Bible, number one, is to demonstrate that God loves all people. We forget that. That God loves all people. And the scripture's pretty clear that he has a desire for all men to come to repentance. And that's number one. That's why the story's in the Bible. Number two, because we forget that. Jonah forgot that. And number two, as his children, because we're his children and that's his heart, that we are to be a people that don't long and desire for the wrath of God to be poured out on our own personal Ninevites. That that shouldn't be the desire of our heart, to, to, to desire and long for God to pour out his wrath on our Ninevites. Why? Why should that not be our heart? Here's the answer. Because you and I were once a people that deserved the wrath of God, but he didn't pour it out on us. He gave us his mercy instead through the cross of Jesus Christ, and that should be the longing of our hearts for our enemies, that they receive the grace that we have been given. <clears throat> so here's what I wanna do. I wanna take just a few minutes and I wanna challenge, I'm gonna ask you guys some challenging questions. And I think the tendency is, maybe as you even hear some of these, to start getting angry and don't do it. Just evaluate whether you're struggling with this instead of getting mad at me. So I'm gonna ask you some tough questions. I'll start off with this. If you're a person that um, you're watching the news or you're on social media, which is from the devil, but if you're on social media and you, you encounter someone that you might consider your enemy, maybe you wouldn't call them that, but man, you don't like them, you don't, you don't like their views, you don't like the way they live, whatever, da, 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 da. <clears throat> what is the predominant, just think about it, what is the predominant disposition of your heart towards them when you encounter them on the news, social media, you see something they've done, hear about something that they've done. Is your attitude, the disposition of your mind and your heart like Jonah? Is it like Jonah? Is that kind of the predominant thing that you, maybe you wouldn't talk about it or say it, but you, you'd kind of like to see him punished? Or is the attitude of your heart that you really wanna see God pour out his grace on them and his mercy on them so they turn from their sin and their lives would be changed and they'd be blessed by God? Give you some examples, and this is when it's gonna get hard, so put your seatbelt on. For, and by the way, these are not ones that I have done well in, just giving you a heads up. This is like group therapy here, here we go. When the Austin bomber killed himself. <clears throat> so obviously there was a, a justifiable relief <clears throat> that um, he was brought to justice for killing those two men and maiming those two others. And I want you to, I read an article shortly after about the young man that was killed, I think he was 17, he was about to go to college and, and then that dad of, I think he had three kids and I want you to know I, I wept for both of them. So there's obviously a justifiable um, relief that justice had come, but what was the attitude of your heart when you found out that he was no longer with us. Was it, were you joyful? Were you gleeful that he kind of got what he deserved? <clears throat> or was the attitude of your heart that you had wished that that young man had been radically changed by the grace and the mercy of God? What about this? What about <clears throat> white supremacist, racist, which is... Um, it's in the news a lot these days. If you encounter one of them, what is the disposition of your heart towards a white supremacist, a racist? Do you hate them? Do you wanna see them punished? <clears throat> if God were to go all Old Testament style on them and go Sodom and Gomorrah on them, would, would that be something you'd be really happy for? Or is the first and primary thought when you encounter somebody that's just lost in their hatred 
towards groups of people is the first attitude of your heart. God, please send your mercy and your grace upon these people that they might be changed. What if God called you to preach the gospel of Christ to a group of white supremacists? Would you go? Or would you run to Tarshish? What about a high profile Christian leader that falls? It's been happening a lot lately. Is there a small part of your heart that kind of takes joy in that? Do you think, man, that dude got what he deserved? He is such a hypocrite. <clears throat> or does it, does it genuinely grieve you? And you pray for that man or woman that God would change them. They would see his blessing through his grace and mercy. What about the person that discriminates against you or treats you poorly because of the color of your skin? What about the person that assumes you're a racist because of the color of your skin? Um, if you're against abortion, what about the, the president of Planned Parenthood? If you're against gun violence, what about the president of the NRA? What about the abuser, the child molester, the rapist? Now again, I'm not saying we don't pursue justice. You pursue justice to the full extent of the law. In those cases, I'm talking about our hearts towards that person. What is the predominant heartbeat that you have as a child of God for those kinds of people? Do you want to see the grace of God change them or deep down inside in places you don't like to talk about, you wanna see them punished? You see, we look at the story of Jonah and dudes being dumb and he's so mad that God saved these people and we kind of shake our head at him, think why in the world would you be angry until we encounter our own Ninevites? Until we encounter our own Ninevites, that group of people or that person that has hurt us so badly that we cannot imagine the concept of God being kind to them. And guys, here's what I'm seeing in the culture. Here's what I'm seeing in the culture. And I've seen it in me. That's why I can preach about this pretty easily. But here's what's happened. In the spirit, in the church, in the spirit of rightly pursuing justice, in the, in the spirit of rightly pursuing what is right and true and good, um, and because I think we have gotten so fed up with the evils of this world that what's occurred is the pendulum has swung so far to one extreme and we've taken on the heart of Jonah and we've lost the heart of the true and the better Jonah whose name is Jesus who spoke that pesky little statement 2,000 years ago when he said, love your enemies. And I fear that even in the church, the pendulum has swung so far to our pursuit of justice that, that the words of Jesus Christ on the Sermon on the Mount no longer mean anything to us. And we flush them down the toilet. And we read them and we go, yeah, but God, you don't know what this guy did or you don't know what this group did. So you don't agree with me, maybe. I want you to take a second, and here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna actually take a drink of water here, and I'm gonna give you a few seconds to actually think for a second. And I want you to think about a person or a group of people that if you were honest, you would least want to see the love and the mercy of God and the grace of God given to. Who would be a person or a group of people that it would be the most difficult for you to walk up to them and share the gospel? All right, I'm getting a drink of water, y'all think about it. All right, you guys got it? Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna read you some of the words of Jesus. <clears throat> every, every word, every single word that I'm gonna read here came out of his mouth. I didn't say this stuff. He said it. So if you're getting mad, get mad at Jesus. And I want you to evaluate whether or not you are applying or even willing to apply those words to that person or that group of people. All right, here we go. 
I'm just gonna read them to you. Matthew 5, 21. Jesus is speaking. He says, you have heard it said to those of old that you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. We're tracking so far. He says, you murder, you're liable to judgment. Everybody says, amen. Watch what he says next. Matthew 5, 22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus says some crazy stuff, y'all. I'm just gonna let you, I'm not even gonna expound on that. Y'all just go home and read it. Matthew 5, 23. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and therefore remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift, therefore, before the altar and go. <clears throat> First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Matthew five thirty eight. You have heard it said that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. <clears throat> If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Matthew 5, 43. You have heard, it, heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Watch this, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. He sends rains on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Simple question, are you engaging your Ninevites that way? Are you even willing to engage your Ninevites that way? way. Even among Christians, even among Christians, I fear we've come to the place where we are all about the Sermon on the Mount when it applies to us. But we're not so keen on the Sermon on the Mount when it applies to that person that's hurt us or wounded us or disrespected us or oppressed us. And by the way, did y'all catch why Jesus said that's how we're to respond to our enemies? Because he said why in there. Did you catch it? because he said some radical stuff. And some of you may be hearing the words of Jesus and go, hey man, if that's what Jesus is about, I'm out. And I get that. But I want you to understand, Jesus said, hey, this is why you respond this way to your enemies. <clears throat> it's in Matthew 5, 45. Jesus said, you do all that, you love your enemies this way, you pray for them, they ask you to go a mile, you go to, you turn the other cheek to them, you don't repay evil, all this crazy stuff. And he says why in Matthew 5, 45, he says, so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. In other words, one of the evidence, he's saying one of the evidences, one of the, one of the marks, one of the ways that you can know that you are a child of God is not how you treat people you love, but it's how you treat people that you don't love. <laughs> It's how you treat people that you can't stand. And guys, I just wanna tell you, and again, I'm, I've been preaching to the choir, I've been preaching to me all week, but we can't blow this off. We can't blow this off. For you to say no to the Sermon on the Mount is for you to say no to what fundamentally makes us Christians. If you say no to the Sermon on the Mount, you're not gonna live it perfectly, but if you say no to it, you're saying no to Christ. And I wanna tell you guys, I, I'm, I, the sermon was so convicting to me because I have been walking in the midst of this for a while. I, this year, in 2018, 2018 and 2017, I was hurt in some ways by some people that are, um, it's more tangible and palpable than any time in my whole life. I mean, I could tell you guys some stories and, and like you would tell me and I would tell you and you wouldn't even believe them. 
how crazy some of the stuff that's gone on over the last few months. And so I just wanna confess to you that I have had to walk through this in my life. I've had the spirit of Jonah in my life when this person wounds me, wounds my family in a crazy way. And the attitude of my heart is, God, I'm cool if you wanna just take them out. In the name of Jesus, amen. <laughs> Start reading some Psalms, man. But when we do that, we really are saying no to Jesus. So I want you to know that I get it. If you're here today and you're like, Matt, I can't do it. You don't know what I've gone through. You don't know what that person put me through. You don't know what kind of suffering I went through at the hands of this group or this person. I just want you to know, I'm not gonna tell you the stories, but I just want you to know in a small way, a small way, I get it. And what has helped me to remember, what's helped me to remember to love my enemies, even when that's the last thing in the world I wanna do, is to remember that Jesus didn't just preach love your enemies, he actually lived it out. I was thinking about the story of when Jesus is being arrested and, and um, the, the, the people that are arresting him are, are walking towards the Garden of Gethsemane. He's been in the garden all night. He's saying, God, if there's any way that this cup can pass for me, that I don't have to go to the cross, I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna be separated from you because of um, the sin of the people. He didn't wanna do it, but God says, you gotta go. And he said, not my will, but you'll be done. He stands up, he never wavers again. He walks right towards his accusers. And then when he's walking towards his accusers, Peter starts acting like an idiot and pulls out his sword. He, he actually does what we probably would have done. He pulls out a sword and he starts whacking at people and chops off a guy's ear. He, I think he missed his, the dude's head. He was probably going for his head. The guy ducked and boom, got his ear, chopped it off. I want you to read this verse, Luke twenty two fifty. Don't turn there, just watch this. <clears throat> and one of them, that's Peter. Luke was being so nice. It was Peter. Um, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear, healed him. Now we, if you grew up in church, you know that story, so you just kind of breeze over, oh yeah, Jesus healed his ear. Think about how crazy that is. Jesus read the Bible. He, knew what, he knows what's coming. He knows what's about to happen. He knows that those men that are right there, they're about to arrest him and they're gonna spend the rest of the night beating him to a bloody pulp. They're gonna beat him within an inch of his life. They're gonna torture him all night long. Peter chops ears off, dude's ears off, and Jesus just reaches up, heals him. I'm convinced Never thought about this till yesterday. I'm convinced that dude's in heaven right now. And you're gonna see him one day. And you're gonna be talking to some dude and he's like, hey man, I was the dude that got my ear cut off. <laughs> Peter did it. <laughs> and you're gonna ask him like, man, how'd you get here? You arrested Jesus. He's gonna say, Jesus healed my ear. I never got over it. It's just a theory. Story of Jesus on the cross. A few short hours later, these men are gonna put nails in his wrists and his feet. They're gonna strip him completely naked and they're gonna spend several hours mocking him until he dies. And one of the things that Jesus is gonna say when he's being crucified, he's just gonna say, Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. Who does that? Jesus loved his enemies. You know, church, there might be, and I'm almost done here, but there, there might be one story in the Bible that might be more radical than all that I just told you. It's probably the, probably the greatest picture I can think of of Jesus loving his enemies. There's this one guy, this one guy. Jesus is in this unbelievable situation because this one guy has failed him and failed him and failed him and failed him over and over and over again. It was this one man that, that denied him over and over and over again. This one guy ran from him. He disobeyed him. 
<clears throat> didn't trust him time and time again. He, he, this one guy downright ab- abandoned him a couple of times, and yet Jesus, it's the story of Jesus pursuing him over and over and over again. Jesus forgiving him over and over and over again despite all this man had done to him. Y'all know the guy I'm talking about? Y'all remember that story? It's me. <laughs> it's me. And it's you too. In Romans 5, 7, Paul says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. And what Paul just said is, hey, nobody wants to die for another person. But if you gotta die for somebody, die for good people. That's what he just said. But in 5, 8, he says, but God... But God shows his love for us. And then while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, Jesus didn't die for a bunch of good people. Jesus died for a bunch of bad people. That's us. And then he goes on. He says, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, that means that by the blood of Jesus we can be made righteous, we can be made holy, we we can be made good. Um, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And then verse 10 is unbelievable. He says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. The greatest story in the Bible of Jesus loving his enemies is his love for you and for me. If you're struggling to love an enemy, if your disgust for them is so real that like Jonah, you'd rather see them destroyed than see the love and mercy of God poured out on them, I think it's critical to remember that you and I were once his enemy because of our sin. But he didn't destroy you, but he came to this earth and on the cross, he was destroyed for you. God doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us undeserved grace and mercy and love. And I'll end with the story and then we'll pray. But a couple days ago, a buddy of mine that I had sent the sermon to to read to make sure I didn't say anything too stupid, um, he sent me a text back and he said, man, this is convicting. And he said, I've been dealing with this too. He said, when the, when the Austin bomber, when it came out that he had killed himself, um, He had a seven-year-old son that had actually seen a TV clip and knew it was going on, and so he had been interested about it. (coughs) And a seven-year-old boy asked my friend about it, and my friend said, yeah, son, he actually, he died, he killed himself. And my friend said that when the seven-year-old boy heard that, he immediately broke into tears, started weeping. My friend said, why are you crying? And the seven-year-old boy said, I'm sad because that man is never gonna have an opportunity to say sorry to God for what he did. Yes, we pursue justice. Yes, we fight against the evils in society. But I pray that we would be a people that never loses the heart of that seven-year-old little boy. Let's pray. If you're here today and you're like, Matt, that's all great and good, but um, because of my sin, I might still be an enemy of God. I want you to know that he loves you and that's why he sent Jesus to this planet, to die and pay the penalty of your sin for you so that if you believe in him and trust in him and say, God, I wanna give you my life, We're reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus and we're no longer enemies, but he makes us his son and his daughter and adopts us into his family, changes our lives. We'll spend eternity with him in heaven. And so if you're here today, if you've never done that, and the best way you know how, just talk to to God and say, God, I, I don't wanna be your enemy any longer. And I wanna receive the gift 
of my salvation through your son. And if you're here and you're like me and you've been walking through this culture with a heart that looks a lot more like Jonah's than Jesus, just ask God to just change you because he's the only one that can. Help him to see that person or that group of people the way that he sees them. Father, please forgive me for when I have not done this well, when I've walked in my flesh. Lord, I pray in those moments I would remember the way that you loved and more importantly, God, I would remember the way that you loved me. And that I would respond out of that. I love you, Lord. I praise you. I thank you. I pray now as we sing to you that we would sing as a response to you and as prayer to you, and as worship to you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. Let's stand together.